So uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, this is the third talk for the third season for the IGCP 6 Point virtual uh, seminar. So today we have uh, Dr. Paolo Sossi. So Paolo is a NSF, uh, no, sorry, SNF Ambition Fellow at the Institute of Geochemistry and Petrology of ETH in Zurich in Switzerland. And today we'll present redox states of Earth magma's ocean and its Venus-like early atmosphere. So uh, now Paolo, the audience is all yours. Let's go, okay. whatever you want. Thank you, Thank you very much, Luke. Uh, firstly for the invitation and then secondly also for the very nice introduction. Um, so I, I had to scroll through what uh, the previous presentations were in this in this sort of seminar series, and I think I would my talk would be some somewhat of an, an anomaly or an outlier uh, relative to the earlier talks. So I hope uh, hope you can bear with me whilst I talk a little bit about um, pre supercontinents and pre uh, pre solid mantle actually, uh, and the importance indeed of looking at the Earth's uh, redox state and specifically that of its magma ocean and how that then in turn influences the composition of its first atmosphere, which you can imagine has implications for how certain processes uh, then on the Earth took place thereafter. And so this, this work is, of course, a collaborative uh, project, and it was done with uh, researchers from the ANU in Canberra, uh, IPGP Paris, uh, as well as the University of Chicago uh, at the Synchrotron APS. Okay, so when we look at the atmospheres of our planetary neighbors, namely Venus and Mars, we see a distinct similarity in their carbon dioxide to nitrogen ratios. And indeed, they are eerily similar in, in the fact that they are both composed despite their very different total pressures. So 92 times Earth's pressure for Venus and 610 pascals for Mars. They are both composed of 97% CO2 and 3% nitrogen, approximately. Where this, where this picture sort of starts to break down is when we look at the Earth's atmosphere. And that, of course, is very rich in nitrogen and poor in CO2, although we as humans are doing our best to, re to reverse this, uh, this observation. So the question is then, why is the Earth so different? And can we tell something about uh, the Earth's initial atmosphere and whether that was perhaps more or less similar to those planets around it. And so that is kind of the initial thrust of this, of this investigation. Um, and in order to better kind of define our terms here, I think it's useful to introduce sort of a classification uh, of how we describe atmospheres and indeed what their relevance is for the genesis of, of the terrestrial planets. So initially, uh, in the first, say, five million years or so of the evolution of our solar system, the nebula gas, i.e. the gas that is, has, has approximately the composition of, of the sun, was still present around the planets. And this is composed largely of hydrogen and some helium. And it is hypothesized that the planets, even the rocky ones, started off with such an atmosphere around them. And this is called a primary atmosphere, as it's denoted here. However, with time, as the nebula gas dispersed after about five million years, these planets were either too hot and or uh, too small to retain such a light atmosphere. And inevitably, it was supplanted by an atmosphere generated from magmatism uh, of the planet, from the planet itself. So either during a magma ocean stage uh, or after solidification of the mantle and then subsequent volcanic outgassing, with the characteristic feature of these so-called secondary atmospheres being that the gases produced are much heavier and far, far less rich in hydrogen and helium. And so we have things like CO, H2O, CO2, et cetera. And during this time, we also have impacts and atmospheric loss that can further modify the composition of the secondary atmosphere. Um, finally, which we, uh, we think is uh, unique to the Earth, is a tertiary atmosphere, and one that is, has been modified by biological activity, and is probably the result, uh, probably results in the high oxygen content of the atmosphere of the present day. But in order to understand this atmosphere, we first need to have a look at um, the atmosphere that we have, was likely to have been produced on the early Earth by such secondary processes as magma ocean crystallization and outgassing. And so it is these secondary atmospheres that we're interested in today. And you may now be asking, well, why does this matter? 
um, what's the importance of knowing what the atmosphere looked like four and a half billion years ago? Well, as it turns out, you know, Charles Darwin had originally hypothesized that life began in these um, areas known as warm little ponds, as he describes them, uh, that were conducive to um, the synthesis of prebiotic compounds. And this idea was taken a little bit further in a more quantitative sense by Harold Urey and, and Stanley Miller, both uh, ironically at the University of Chicago, where part of this research was done. And in 1952, they, they performed a relatively uh, groundbreaking experiment uh, known as now known as the Miller-Urey experiment in which they subjected a reducing atmosphere composed of methane and ammonia to uh, spark discharge here in order to simulate lightning in the presence of water. And so this is a hypothesized conditions that may have existed on the early earth. And the importance of this was that they found uh, after the experiment that there were, they, they, they produced some of the 20, some 23 amino acids, uh, some of which are, are necessary for uh, the building blocks of life. Uh, and so this led to then to the very important notion that um, such an atmosphere on the early earth must have comprised uh, these methane and ammonia compounds in order for life to then to flourish. The question then becomes, did such atmospheres really exist on the early earth, or is this some sort of just um, favorable uh, pipe dream scenario? So in order to have a look at this question, we have to go back in time and assess whether the earth really contained, had, had a primary atmosphere, what was it, what, what did it consist of? And we've known almost for a hundred years now that that on Earth, there is an abnormal scarcity of the inert gases, i.e. the noble gases. Um, and this is important and uh, specifically because of not only their low abundance, but their low abundance relative to other similarly volatile elements, such as shown here in, in the green columns. So this, this, this plots the depletion factor of these elements relative to the sun, not to CI chondrites, and it shows that the more reactive gases, such as hydrogen and nitrogen, are less depleted than the noble gases. And this observation is a strong, strong evidence to suggest that because these, these uh, elements essentially are only present in the atmosphere and, and are not locked away due to, because they're insoluble in condensed phases, that the Earth has lost its initial primary atmosphere, i.e. it has lost its nebular atmosphere as attested to by the low abundances of these noble gases. Um, and so this, this strong depletion in, in, insinuates that uh, Earth has a secondary, i.e. post-nebula atmosphere. Um, so one that was generated from degassing of, uh, of heated, uh, heated rocks. So a mechanism that may lead to this depletion in the inert gases is um, is, 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 is an obvious one, and that is the moon forming giant impact. So if we can imagine the canonical situation in which the proto-Earth uh, symbolized here was struck by a Mars-sized impactor, so about 15% of the mass of the, of the Earth, um, any pre-existing atmosphere would have been quantitatively removed, not only due to, um, due to thermal energy and thermal escape, but also due to things like a gravitational shock wave that propagated through uh, the proto-Earth uh, leading to atmospheric blow-off. Um, and so we can imagine this event, which occurred perhaps between uh, 50 and 100 million years after the birth of the solar system, we can imagine this event would have effectively reset the composition of any pre-existing atmosphere on Earth and replaced it with a new one. Um, so this energy is enough to importantly enough to melt the entire mantle. And so this then also gives us our initial condition of a, an early terrestrial magma ocean on the, on the planet Earth. And so if we also look in more detail as to the isotopic composition of these noble gases, we see that particularly for xenon, um, the isotopic system iodine xenon demonstrates that um, these gases were lost prior to 100 million years uh, after the birth of the solar system. And this has been revised recently with the recognition that there's been some additional xenon loss thereafter, and it's, so into the Archean. And so this estimate has been revised downwards to about 40 to 50 million years, again, approximately coinciding with such a, a moon forming giant impact. So this seems to be a relatively uh, um, apt uh, mechanistic scenario to explain why 
the Earth doesn't have a primary atmosphere and was its atmosphere today was probably initially set by some sort of magma ocean scenario. Okay, then the question becomes, of course, was this magma ocean uh, oxidizing and therefore probably likely to be uh, degassing species such as CO2 and H2O, or was it as Yuri and Stanley Miller would have it and rich in ammonia and methane? So there is this considerable uncertainty then as to the redox state of the LA atmosphere, simply because we don't know what the redox state of the magma ocean was. However, if we consider the thermodynamic relationship that if the magma ocean was in equilibrium with this atmosphere, then by definition, the oxygen fugacity of the uh, atmosphere must be equal to the oxygen fugacity of the magma ocean at the surface. And so we can use this thermodynamic relationship to uh, understand the composition of the atmosphere if we understand the composition of the magma ocean, of which we perhaps have a record today in, in, the, in, the, in the form of peridotites. So the key thermodynamic reaction then, or chemical reaction, is uh, shown here, in which we have uh, iron 2 plus in the silicate, which is the most, so iron is the most abundant polyvalent element in silicates, silicate melts. So if we have iron 2 plus uh, and iron 3 plus in our silicate melt, then we can write a balanced chemical reaction, which states that the FO2, or the oxygen fugacity here, is a, is a stoichiometric um, function of the iron 3 plus to iron 2 plus ratio in the silicate. So this connects now our magma ocean with our atmosphere. So if we write then the equilibrium constant for this reaction, we can see that the uh, FO2 uh, shown here will, so the fugacity of oxygen, will depend on um, the equilibrium constant. And this is known for pure phases. So if we have pure FeO and pure FeO 1.5 or hematite, Fe203, uh, it depends then on because we're not dealing with pure phases, it then depends on the activities of Fe3 plus and Fe2 plus in our silicate melt. And then, uh, this, then this gives us our oxygen fugacity. Alternatively, what we can do in experiments is to actually control the oxygen fugacity, measure the activities, and then determine the relationship between the activities and the oxygen fugacity experimentally. However, there has been, there has been you know, a few obstacles to performing this, uh, this sort of um, experiment because um, this Fe3 plus to 2 plus ratio, as I mentioned, is not amongst pure phases, but is amongst iron 3 plus and iron 2 plus dissolved in magma. And therefore, it not only depends on the oxygen fugacity, but it also depends on the composition of the liquid that, in which these, this iron is dissolved as well as the temperature, which, which affects not only the activities, but also the equilibrium constant of the reaction. So up till now, this has been relatively well studied for basaltic rocks, but it is essentially unknown for peridotites. And this is, this is obviously key because peridotites are a better approximation of the composition of the Earth's mantle than our basalts. And so that is the objective of this work, is to understand this relationship for peridotite liquids that are representative of the magma ocean. So here, just to illustrate how poorly known this is uh, for peridotite compositions, we, we wanted to test uh, existing calibrations for this reaction uh, and apply them to peridotite conditions. So at very high temperatures, so 1900 degrees Celsius and a peridotitic composition with a fixed iron three plus to two plus ratio. And so what I show here is that the oxygen fugacity calculated by various different models, so these are the gray vertical lines, assuming a constant iron 3 plus 2 plus varies by over uh, seven orders of magnitude. Um, so what we see is that um, any given existing model could be wrong by uh, a great degree. And that is important because if this model is correct, this vertical line is correct, then we have a CO and H2 rich atmosphere. So this is plotting the relative proportion of CO and CO2 and H2 and H2O. Whereas if this model is correct, then we have uh, a CO2 and an H2O rich atmosphere. Therefore, clearly the existing work is, is completely unsuitable to constraining what type of composition of the atmosphere we have on the early earth um, if we have a peridotite liquid in an early magma ocean setting. Okay, so 
that's the aim of the study, to calibrate this reaction for a prototype liquid composition at the appropriate temperature. But this is uh, harder than it, than it sounds because pyritites um, melt at very high temperatures. So you can see this is a composition of a nominal pyritite shown here, uh, which is modeled after the Kilbourne Hole um, pyritite uh, and is meant to represent a sort of a nominal Earth's mantle composition. And so the, the, big, the big difference between pyritites and basalts is the MgO content. As you can see here, typical basalts maybe have 10% MgO, whereas pyritite has here, in this case, about 38 um, and so this means that the liquidus temperature, i.e. the temperature at which it is fully molten, is much, much higher, uh, so above 1800 degrees Celsius. So in order to be able to melt such a composition, we looked at uh, experiments in an aerodynamic laser levitation furnace uh, at the Institut de Physique du Globe de Paris. And so this is capable of going up to um, uh, in excess of 2000 degree degrees. Um, so I can just show you exa an example of how this looks like, if this works. So here we have our sample at very high temperatures. Uh, here's our floating glass ball. Uh, as you can see, the temperature is in excess of 1900 Celsius. We keep it there for about 30 seconds in order for it to equilibrate. Uh, and by then shutting the power down to the laser, it quenches at a rate of about 800 degrees per second and we're able to preserve the high temperature chemistry of the prototype liquid in the form of a uh, glass sphere. As you can see, it's a sort of a, a reflective glassy ball. Um, and what we do there is to sort of simulate a miniature Earth, essentially, in the sense that the gas flowing through, this, flowing through the nozzle that you can see here uh, is changed according to the type of atmosphere that we want to reproduce. And so we do this by varying the CO2 to H2 ratio of the flowing gas that is levitating our, our glass, our melt sphere. And we then vary systematically the oxygen fugacity of the gas stream between uh, 1 or 1.5 orders of magnitude below the ion type buffer and five orders of magnitude above the ion type buffer. And this then gives us a nice spread of what we should expect for the ion three plus to two plus ratio uh, in our experimental glasses. So the next step after we've synthesized uh, our samples is to determine indeed this ratio um, by spectroscopic methods. And the, met the weapon of choice in this case is known as Zanes, so X-ray absorption near edge structure. Um, and this was formed at the GSC cars beam line at uh, the APS in Chicago. And so what this essentially consists of is that our sample, our glass is bombarded with uh, X-rays that are of a specific energy in order to excite electronic transitions within the ion atoms. And depending on the number of electrons uh, around the ion atom, that transition will occur at finally different energies and intensities. And so this is what we see here. So in reduced glasses, we have a, a peak at a, at a particular energy at about 7.1 uh, kilo electron volts. Um, and this peak uh, shifts, however, in position as we go to more and more oxidized glasses. So here we can see the peak shifting to higher energies and higher intensities as we have more iron three plus in the glass. And this essentially relates to a, a 1s to 3d electron transition in which there are more sites available in the, uh, for the electrons to jump to between the valence and the or between the, yeah, between the electron shells. And this then leads to a higher intensity uh, absorption at, at this energy, which we can then empirically relate to uh, the ion three plus to ion two plus content of the glass. So what we do is we use, pick two of these empirical features. So we use the centroid energy. So the energy of this small pre-edge feature and the energy at which this edge feature, which you can see also shifts to higher energy as you go to more oxidized conditions. So there are our two parameters that we use to quantify the ion three plus to ion two plus ratio. So in order to do that, we also have to look at uh, glasses that have been calibrated independently. So this is not an absolute technique in the sense that we also need some sort of calibrant. Uh, and in this case, we use um, mid-ocean ridge basalt standards whose ion three plus to two plus ratio has been measured independently by a technique known as Mersbauer spectroscopy. And what we show here is that just to verify that these 
standards are indeed good fits and good uh, calibrants for our unknowns, i.e. the peridotites, because they are different compositions. And so what this shows is that the edge energy and the centroid energy um, increase uh, in a systematic fashion in both the standards and in the unknowns, so that we can be confident that um, this, this, this method of normalization is robust and appropriate for our samples. And with this, with this uh, methodology, we can uh, achieve a sort of a precision of about 1.5% uh, relative on the uh, iron 3 plus 2 total iron ratio of the glasses. Okay. So this is the experimental side. However, in order to relate these experiments to uh, the Earth, so the actual natural conditions in which the Earth has, has evolved, um, we need to relate the iron 3 plus 2 plus ratio from our glasses to the iron 3 plus 2 plus ratio of natural peridotites. And again, this is uh, done by a technique, uh, by the Mustard spectroscopy technique, uh, in which uh, in the 1990s, Dante Keneal and Hugh O'Neill went about separating individual minerals from these peridotites and, and measuring precisely their, their iron 3 plus to 2 plus ratios. So this, this painstaking exercise resulted in uh, a, a a whole, a whole host of data in, in which we can see here that olivine essentially has no iron 3 plus, whereas something like spinel or CPX has, you know, 15 to 20 percent iron 3 plus. Um, and from this information, we can reconstruct the iron 3 plus to total iron ratio of the whole rock peridotite. And we do this for a global array of peridotites from orogenic uh, continental settings and protonic settings. Um, and what you see here is essentially the whole rock reconstructed iron 3 plus total iron ratio on the y-axis and the MGO content of the peridotite on the x-axis. And what is, what is quite striking is that there's this negative correlation between the two quantities. And this makes practical sense because, uh, as I mentioned, olivine has essentially no iron 3 plus and it is often the residual phase that is left behind during partial melting of the mantle. So if you remove the, the clinopyroxene and the CPX uh, from the mantle peridotite, then you drive the iron 3 plus content down. And so in order to get a better estimate of the uh, representative estimate of the entire mantle, what we need to do is to pick uh, the peridotite composition that best reflects that, comp that, that whole mantle composition which is, which is listed here as the bulk silicate earth composition as derived from sort of cosmochemical and uh, analytical estimates. And this turns out to be about 37% MGO. And at that MGO content, we have an Fe3 plus total line ratio of about 3.7 plus or minus 0.5%. And so that's our sort of target value for which we want to achieve in the, uh, in the experimental work. And so here is our experimental calibration. As I mentioned, we changed the composition of the gas mixture in order to create a spread in oxygen fugacities. And then we measured the resulting iron 3 plus to 2 plus ratio. And these are our data points plotted here. Now, interestingly, the slope of this line should equal the stoichiometric coefficient shown in this relationship here. So the slope is, should be equal to one quarter. And indeed, that, that is what we recover uh, within uncertainty. And so this is this is a, a nice um, thermodynamic um, sort of verification of the reaction that's taking place in our peridotite liquids. Um, and so what then to do, apply this calibration curve to natural rocks, uh, as I mentioned, we take this 3.7% value and say that the uh, value measured in peridotites is the same as that that would have been present in the early Earth's magma ocean and then we, that allows us to simply read off what the oxygen fugacity at the surface of the magma ocean um, would have been. So this uh, value, which is shown here, uh, is a, a, a half a log unit above the iron vistite buffer. So half a log unit above the oxygen fugacity at which iron metal is stable. And this then uniquely fixes the CO2 to CO and the H2O to H2 ratios in the atmosphere at that given temperature. Um, however, in order to uh, get a unique understanding of what the atmosphere looked like, we, we not only need the oxygen fugacity, which is given by our calibration, but we also need to know the H on C and the H on N ratio if we're considering a system 
of an atmosphere composed of H, C, N, and O, the major, the major gas species. And so in order to calculate the H on C and the H on N ratios of the atmosphere, we need to firstly know what the abundances in the bulk silicate earth are, which are relatively uh, well known. And secondly, how soluble they are in peridocyte liquids at high temperatures. And so this then will determine um, the fraction of each of these elements that are dissolved in the peridocyte magma ocean and the fraction that are present then in the atmosphere. So this is what I'll just briefly go over now. Um, because we are relatively oxidizing or mildly oxidizing conditions, we don't, um, we don't consider too much the solubility of uh, CO or H2, and they're also very insoluble in silicate melts. And so we can limit our assessment to uh, the solubility of water, H2O, which dissolves by this sort of coupled reaction in which uh, we have the uh, concentration of water in the silicate melt being proportional to the square root of the uh, uh, water fugacity in the atmosphere. Uh, CO2, which dissolves as predominantly the carbonate ion, and N2, which dissolves as molecular N2. And so if we apply uh, calibrations of these solubility reactions, again, it suffers the same problem as ion 3 plus uh, to 2 plus in the sense that these reactions are only calibrated for basalts and not for prudotites. However, if we make that, that, small, that small leap, then what we see is that here we show the solubility curve for water in blue and in CO2 in yellow. And what this essentially means is that water is much more soluble than is CO2 in the sense that if we have a given FH2O or FCO2 for FH2O, if we have about five bars, then we can dissolve about a thousand ppm. But as you can see for if we have CO2, if we have five bars of CO2, we're not even uh, above the zero point essentially. So what this means is that um, 99 percent of the water and about 35 percent of the CO2 is dissolved in the magma ocean, whereas nitrogen has essentially no solubility um, and is entirely in the atmosphere. And we, we, can, we can solve for this by, by solving the mass balance equation, which is the total equals the amount in the atmosphere plus the amount in the melt. So we can solve that equation given the solubility constants of these reactions. Okay. So now once we've defined the H and C and the H on N ratio of the atmosphere, what I've done here is to uh, look at a Gibbs free energy minimization of the atmospheric composition. So we start off at our initial conditions determined by our peridotite magma ocean, uh, in which we have a molar H on C ratio of 0.22 and an oxygen fugacity of uh, plus 0.5 above the iron vistite buffer. And this gives us an atmospheric speciation at high temperature of mainly CO and CO2 because most of the water, as I mentioned, is dissolved in the magma ocean, and then subordinate amounts of H2 and H2O. So this, this picture doesn't, very, doesn't change very much um, below the solidus, uh, sorry, above the solidus, uh, but as we decrease in temperature, importantly, at about 1,000 Kelvin, we have, this, we have the precipitation of graphite, and because we're just taking out C and leaving the other components in the atmosphere, this induces an increase in the relative oxygen fugacity of the atmosphere as, as it's cooling, and this means that the CO and the H2 essentially drop out to nothing, and we're left with CO2, uh, N2, and H2O, up to the point at which H2O also condenses into, into the oceans, and we're left with an atmosphere with CO2 and N2. And this is, what, this is approximately the pressures, so about 70 bars of CO2, two bars of nitrogen, and the CO2 to N2 ratio of about 35. And if you recall in the, in the first slide, this is very, very similar to the CO2 to N2 ratio of Venus today. Um, and so on this basis, we can, can probably conclude that the composition of the early terrestrial atmosphere likely resembled that of Venus today. Um, so this is an interesting, interesting observation, I think. Um, some of you may then be asking, what about water? So that previous calculation has assumed that the water remains dissolved in the magma ocean uh, during, uh, during its cooling. However, that may not necessarily be the case. As the magma ocean cools and crystallizes, perhaps some of that water that was initially dissolved is expelled into the atmosphere, uh, and that would then result in a change in the composition. So this is what I've modeled here. Um, again, this is Gibbs free energy minimization calculation in which we can vary the H on C ratio of the atmosphere and the oxygen fugacity of the atmosphere we start off here at our black square with most of the water dissolved. But as if we assume that some of that water degasses, so 10%, 25%, et cetera, up to 
then the composition of the atmosphere slowly changes into one dominated from, by CO and CO2 into one dominated by H2 and H2O. Um, and if we look at the same composition, but now at 300 Kelvin, then we see that CO2 to N2 atmospheres, sort of Venus-like atmospheres, are stable up till about 80% uh, degassing of water. So if we degas more than 80% of the water, then we may fall into the, uh, a different atmospheric field, so CH4 and N2. However, this is relatively unlikely. So this is very much an upper limit for the amount of water that could be degassed. And so what this, what this suggests is that this sort of CO2 to N2 rich atmosphere that we do observe on Venus and Mars today is a likely consequence of uh, a magma ocean derived atmosphere from the initial history of the, of the planets. Then the question uh, becomes why then if this CO2 to N2 atmosphere is so stable, why is the Earth now so distinct from its planetary neighbors? And it, indeed, this has this heliocentric bracketing of planets with CO2 to N2 atmospheres uh, in the 97 to 3 ratio. Well, there's a couple of parameters. So if we, if we think now that Earth's atmosphere was initially of the same composition, these changes must have been brought about by some sort of physical transformation. And so, there are two key factors here to consider. The first is that the Earth receives about half as much solar irradiance as does Venus, but about twice as much as Mars due to its uh, heliocentric distance. So this curve shows the uh, UV flux, which can be easily predicted. And secondly, Earth is much larger than Mars, but similar in size to Venus. Um, and so to quantify the meaning of these, of these differences in planetary properties, we can turn to a quantity known as the escape parameter. So this lambda-esque relates to the facility with which uh, atmospheres can escape from the terrestrial planets, from any planet. Um, and what it shows is that um, it shows the relative importance of the mass of the gas species, the velocity required for a gas to acquire in order to escape the gravitational field of the planet, and the thermal velocity of the gas. Um, and so the higher the value, the more difficult it is for a particle to escape from the planet. Um, and so with that in mind, we can draw some, some broad brush conclusions in the sense that we can say that lighter masses, uh, so loss is more efficient for lighter masses, i.e. hydrogen and helium, uh, com as compared to CO2 and nitrogen, uh, for smaller bodies that have a low escape velocity, and for hotter atmospheres, i.e. with a high temperature at the exabase or the escaping point, wherever that may be. Um, and so if we then consider the, um, the uh, hierarchy of these planets, so we see that the Earth is uh, large, and so it has a high V-S, and it's also cooler than Venus, so it has a low T. Um, and so what we would expect is that the Earth would be the least efficient in losing its atmosphere, Whereas uh, Venus, so whereas Mars and particularly Venus would have undergone quite significant atmospheric loss in their in their uh, geological history, and so this this sort of hierarchy is attested to not only by this these sort of calculations but also by the deuterium to hydrogen ratio that is preserved in their atmospheres. And so if we normalize the D to H ratio um, uh, to the Earth's, then we see that Mars has a high D2H ratio of about six and Venus much higher of about 150. And this, <clears throat> this ratio essentially indicates uh, the degree of hydrogen loss relative to deuterium. So the lighter isotope relative to the heavier isotope. And what this shows is that um, both v Mars and particularly Venus have lost significant quantities of water from their atmospheres relative to the Earth. And so the conclusion that we make is that the Earth retains its water on its surface over geological timescales, whereas Venus and Mars do not, or at least not as much. And this is then important because, um, again, Harold Urey crops up again um, in his Urey reaction, in which we have carbonate, uh, gaseous, gaseous carbon dioxide, is a prominent uh, factor in controlling the chemical weathering of um, silicates, so in this case, calcium silicate to produce calcite and uh, SiO2. 
Um, but we can equally write this reaction for different, so Mg or Fe and what have you. And so these equilibrium curves indicate the equilibrium constants for these sorts of reactions. So the different numbers refer to the different species. And this is from a paper from Norm Sleep in 2001. And so the importance of water in this is that it catalyzes this reaction to the, i.e. pushing it to the right, because uh, if CO2 is, is, is easily dissolved in water, then that can then penetrate the rocks and uh, it favors chemical weathering by this process and therefore uh, aids in sea burial, which is also compounded by the fact that we think that the Earth is the only planet to have had plate tectonics uh, over its geological history, which would have then assisted in burying, not only extracting that carbon from the atmosphere, but then burying it deep in the Earth as well. Um, and so this is, thought to have been a, an effective method for drawing down the CO2 on Earth, but not on uh, Venus and Mars. Um, and so this just illustrates what, what, what I mean here in the sense that if we have 100 degree uh, uh, temperature at the Earth's surface, then the equilibrium constant of this reaction is such that our equilibrium CO2 partial pressure will be 10 to the minus two uh, bars. So if these reactions are allowed to progress, then they, they buffer the CO2 content of the atmosphere to relatively low levels, as shown here on the y-axis. So how does this then relate to our initial uh, Miller-Urey type atmospheres? What's, what, why is this important for the development of life? So I don't pretend to have all the answers, of course, but um, uh, it's just to mention that uh, studies subsequent to that have shown that CO2 to N2 atmospheres are relatively inefficient for, synthesis, for the synthesis of amino acids, uh, only producing glycine. But um, recent studies in which we have the water buffered at a pH of about seven with this calcium carbonate that we think would have been present then due to the drawdown of CO2, uh, we see that um, uh, the yields of amino acids are, are far increased, although they are still about half of what we would obtain from a reducing Miller-Urey type uh, atmosphere in which CH4 and NH3 are present. So there is still hope for Charles Darwin, even in uh, this sort of setting with CO2 and N2 rich atmospheres, but um, that's perhaps uh, a story for people that know more about this, uh, this aspect to, to go on with. Um, so yeah, these are the conclusions. Um, we calibrated the dependence of iron three plus to two plus ratio on FO2 in pyridophyte liquids as relevant to planetary magma oceans. Uh, from this, we can say that the Earth probably had a neutral Venus-like atmosphere with about uh, CO2 to N2 in 97 to, to three ratio. Um, it is then the, the size of the Earth and its distance from the sun that allowed it to retain water on its surface. And then this would have then facilitated this drawdown of such a, of such a CO2 atmosphere post-magma ocean on the Earth. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>